Thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Kaiser. Well, for a man that doesn't need any introduction, I will introduce him. Uh, Dennis Jenkins um, is a renowned archaeologist that works at the U uh, University of Oregon, and um, following in the footsteps of Luther Cressman and other greats, Dennis has gone to reinvestigate sites like Conley Caves and Paisley Five Mile Caves and done some of the most breathtaking and amazing archaeology that has been done in the Western US. And so um, tonight, Dennis is going to do one of his fantastic talks. I've heard him many, many times, and he's just top notch. And uh, I won't tell you about it. I'll let Dennis uh, tell you. Dr. Jenkins. <laughs> oh, hey, you want? All right. Do I need these? No, you just hooked me up. Am I hooked up? Okay. All right. Which way is forward on this? To the right? All right. Okay, so can you all hear me now? <laughs> all right. Um, so I, I'm going to be talking about the Paisley Caves. I, uh, first of all, would like to say thank you um, to the, uh, particularly the uh, Burns Paiute tribes and, and uh, as well as the Klamath tribes that represent the uh, Yahuskan uh, Paiutes, the Klamath and the Modocs. That's the country uh, that used to be theirs and was ceded. Uh, uh, under the 1864 um, treaty. So um, what we have done uh, there every year, we go and, and, and talk with uh, the tribes and um, find out what they're interested in. The reason we went uh, to the uh, Paisley Caves to begin with was because Luther Crestman had been there and had found uh, camel and horse bones of the Pleistocene. And so uh, that was in the 1930s, 1938, 39, and 40. And, uh, and then he published it in 1940, said that he had proven that people were in the Northern Great Basin um, uh, during the uh, Ice Age. Uh, it didn't take long. And the archaeologists of that time, thinking that people couldn't live out in this desert without uh, basketry and such, um, more or less ask him for the evidence. Um, you know, they wanted to see exactly where those bones had been found and exactly where the artifacts had been found. Unfortunately, he couldn't respond to that. And so when I came on the scene uh, in the uh, right around 2000, um, it was an interesting prospect that you would perhaps go back to this site uh, and do some excavation. But uh, one of my friends uh, from the University of Washington said, Dennis, you know, when I heard that you were taking the field school back there, I thought, well, that's interesting, but, you know, it looks like a battlefield and I don't think there's anything there. So um, that's how we got uh, introduced um, to the uh, cave, um, the uh, site. So basically the Paisley Caves are in the Summer Lake Basin. Um, during the Pleistocene, uh, they would have called this Winter Lake. It's on Highway 31, uh, as you're going south, and about five miles north uh, of the little town of Paisley, population uh, approximately 400. So it's kind of amazing to go to Europe and, uh, you know, and give a talk and then have people tell you, oh, yeah, you're from Paisley, uh, you know. I, and I said, well, how do you know that? I mean, that is such a tiny little town. Everybody knows about Paisley, as uh, what one uh, German uh, scientist told me. Anyway, this is uh, the view from Winter Rim, looking down across the, the basin. The ridge there in the, in the distance is Five Mile Ridge. It's on Bureau of, of Land Management uh, Managed Properties. And people ask me quite frequently, can can we go and visit? And I say, absolutely, you know, go there. It belongs to all of us. Uh, when you leave, 
you know, leave all the artifacts or anything, take photographs, you know, take a lot of photographs, stand there and look out over that plain and try to imagine what it was like 14,000 years ago. So anyhow, um, about 18 uh, to 17,000 years ago, um, the lake, which occupied this basin, began to fall. And so it had risen up uh, probably somewhere in the 20 to 30,000 year range and the wave action um, constantly crashing into uh, the cliffs picked out very soft uh, volcanic tuff and um, left the basalt um, behind. So you end up with these voids where the soft rock was and the wave action constantly crashing into the caves has picked out the rock. So there are actually uh, about eight um, different rock shelters and caves there. We've worked in caves one, two, um, three, uh, which uh, um, uh, Cressman had called four, and then cave number five. So I've listed the three here that you will see the majority of the information from. Luther Cressman was taken to the caves in 1937 uh, at the end of the field season by a gentleman named Walt Perry, who lived in Bend and had uh, been out in this area as a forester for years. And so he was interested in um, archaeology, geology, paleontology, uh, and consequently was banging around in the desert uh, and had volunteered for Luther Cressman uh, for a couple of years over in Catlow Valley. Um, he knew that Cressman was trying to prove that people had been in that area um, at the, as the water fell um, from the Pleistocene lakes. So uh, he went, uh, oh. Luther Cressman went to the site in 1938 uh, and looked at uh, some of the holes that uh, Perry had already excavated in caves one and two and uh, began his excavations in, uh, around in, in cave number one in particular. So we could not find cave number one. <laughs> so because he described it as this absolutely beautiful, wide open cave uh, with a gorgeous portico. Um, and eventually looking at the photographs in the museum that he had taken, we realized that this was cave number one, that that huge boulder uh, roof fall had occurred um, since 1940. So uh, we went uh, in 2002, I took the field school there, opened up uh, a one by one at the back of the cave, uh, trying to find out whether or not Luther Cressman had actually reached bedrock, had he gotten all the way um, down, uh, because he, one, he did not um, find uh, horse or camel remains from this particular cave. So had he actually gotten into those Pleistocene deposits at the bottom? So we were excavating through nice compact, uh, compact sediments, finding uh, bits of cordage, some uh, broken points, broken scrapers and such, and got down about two feet, down to 70 centimeters, and suddenly found an Olympia beer can, a Snickers wrapper, and Lucky Strike cigarette packages, and I stopped the excavations. It was clear that that had all been redeposited by people digging after Luther Cressman had left. So we moved to the front of the cave and began to excavate. And um, I reasoned that underneath that huge rock, um, no one had excavated under there. Uh, a couple of students actually asked me, um, Dr. Jenkins, what are we gonna do if an earthquake occurs? Should we stay in here, you know, inside the cave or should we run out of the cave and go down the hill? and? Uh, you look out there, there are rocks the size of small houses out there. And I thought, oh my goodness, I don't know. But I'll tell you what, if you were under that boulder right there, the weight has already been distributed. So if the roof falls, it's going to bounce off. People will have to get you out, but you'll be safe. And they, And so I said, you know, like, you want to dig a hole under there? And they said, sure. So I got uh, number three there excavated, and um, we found uh, 
beautiful uh, stratigraphy. Now, as an archaeologist, what you want to see are strata that tend to be lying flat or at least all going exactly the same direction. If that's not the case, expect, especially if people have been digging for artifacts and such, you end up with this very jumbled appearance and the colors will vary frequently what we call modeled, O-T-T-L-E-D. And that means that you're seeing different soils that have been mixed together. So what you're seeing here are nice flat lying um, deposits near the bottom uh, of the cave here. And right down at the very bottom stratum LU1 is a nice reddish colored, very um, silty uh, deposit, uh, silty sand. And right above it is a lighter deposit that's more coarse, that's gravel. And so basically it has been deposited in an instant or very quickly. And so uh, the reddish color there is rat urine. So we have wood rats living in the caves and they have always lived there since the end of the, uh, the Pleistocene when the lakes fell. And so they're adding a little bit of urine each night. Virtually every surface is, uh, has this very distinctive acrid odor to it. And you, by the end of the day, if you're excavating and there's dust flying, you can taste it in your mouth, you're not going to get away from it. But here um, at our densest um, cultural debris, the most artifacts are coming out of the bottom of the cave and they tend to be uh, right around 12,000 years. And we found that to be basically um, the pattern uh, throughout the site. <clears throat> That's the uh, what we would call a, a very cool um, and generally dry period uh, that's called the Younger Dryas era. And so uh, during that period, um, what we'll see here in this cave and virtually every cave we've excavated in, as we got down to about 12,000 years, the amount of um, pronghorn antelope um, bones just increased dramatically. Rabbits are uh, continuous throughout the profile, but boy, you get down to that bottom and there's just a whole lot of, of uh, rabbit bone uh, and hide uh, being preserved. So how in the world is it that coprolites or anything else that's perishable could remain 14,000 years uh, in the site? And the answer is aridity. This is, these are extremely arid um, sites. Uh, the interiors of the caves do not get wet. Once in a while, an extremely intense um, storm will occur, maybe once in a thousand years, and water will occur, accumulate on the back of the cave and then hit the floor and flow out through the mouth of the cave. What that does is to leave these thin uh, mud or stringers, silt stringers. It, it accumulates this very fine dust and then lays it down over uh, the, um, the cave surface. So with those things are wonderful because they give you this evidence that you're digging an undisturbed deposit. So you end up with this ceiling that once again, an archeologist wants to know in that time period, at least, you know, you're looking at a single event or a, not a single event, but multiple events, but they represent a single slice of time. And so um, that's one of the really wonderful things about the Paisley Caves as well. This is a hearth uh, with antelope um, bones around it, lots of obsidian uh, and lots of charcoal indicating uh, it was about 12,500 years ago. One of the interesting things we found, you know, as you can see uh, from the first photograph of the site, it's in a, a wide open plain with uh, sagebrush surrounding it. There are no trees uh, out in the basin. Uh, so we were kind of surprised when we took a soil sample from out uh, from underneath a large boulder uh, in cave number one and came up uh, with these ponderosa pine uh, nuts. And the shells have been uh, chewed open by rodents. Um, I've been told by uh, Vaughn Bryant that Texas A&M that uh, the pollen profiles from the site do not indicate that ponderosa pine was actually on the site. 
for years, I told people that this was the evidence that those pine trees were actually growing out there. Um, but then we have also come up with um, pine cones, the actual, not the whole cone, but um, you know, the leaves on the cones and such, and dated them consistently right around uh, 11,800 to 500 uh, years ago. So basically, uh, Bond thought that, that these were artifacts. These are um, the evidence of food that has been brought to the site uh, by Native Americans uh, at this early time period and then stolen uh, probably at night or from cash pits um, by the wood rats that are virtually everywhere. And uh, so that's um, basically some of our uh, studies that we have done in pollen, uh, as well as reconstructing the environment uh, as much as possible, you know, from um, very small mammals uh, as well as fish that we have looked at um, that are uh, in the deposits indicating where the lake stood and, and looked at isotopes and such um, as well. This is cave number two, right next to cave number one. Uh, as you can see, it is really a dark um, and uh, relatively deep cave. Um, Luther Cressman uh, only dug uh, a couple of small trenches here. We actually found um, the evidence for those uh, trenches and have looked at all of his maps and such. Um, what is really unique about this particular cave is it's very dark. That was a, uh, right behind those screeners was a very large roof fall that fell about 2,100 years ago, probably uh, when Slide Mountain fell right across um, uh, the valley and it just, you know, took the whole side of the mountain and distributed it out uh, along winter rim. So that must have been a horrendous um, earthquake. This um, ceiling apparently came down. We found a human coprolite just below that, mat, that massive rock uh, indicating and dated it and indicates uh, right around 2,100 years ago that that occurred. But what you're looking at here is in indeed um, some wood rat pellets uh, and nesting material, but the, uh, about 90% of what you're looking at is bat um, guano. So you've got bats hanging in there. They have their nurseries there. Um, they're dropping their feces and it's just building up at about oh, one centimeter per uh, 58 years. So um, what you, once again, you can see the layering in here that indicates um, this is an undisturbed uh, and very nicely stratified deposit. Um, the 7,640 date that you're looking at were three um, bat pellets that were adhering to the first grains of Mount Mazama um, ash. So when Crater Lake was formed um, by the, uh, by Mount Mazama. Uh, it laid down nice white deposits uh, in the caves. And so we took three um, rat pellets and ran that date. Uh, I consider that probably the most accurate date uh, for the eruption, the climactic eruption of Mount Mazama. And then uh, once again, we get down to oh, about uh, 11 uh, to 12,000 years ago and suddenly, you know, the number of artifacts just goes through the roof and you can see this very large hearth um, that is uh, deposited at the bottom there. This is a way that we can look at, um, you know, uh, through percentages of uh, artifacts, bones, uh, and coprolites. Uh, so, you know, you see in the bright red, uh, all the artifacts and they're kind of, you know, you know, staggered uh, here and there through time. Uh, you've got the late um, Holocene uh, up at the top, level uh, one through seven there, and then it drops way off. And then the middle Holocene, uh, once again, kind of a surge in artifacts and coprolites and large uh, mammal bones. And then, uh, you know, a very long area there, about 2,500 years with very few people um, in the caves at all, 
But you get down around uh, 10,000 radiocarbon years or 11,800, and suddenly the number of artifacts just goes through the roof. And this is an intensive period of activity inside the caves. Um, this is what we have called the botanical lens because there is so much sagebrush in it. What we think is going on, people are living in the caves. They're to some degree defecating in there, um, urinating in there. Uh, we just have a tremendous uh, amount of evidence for processing animals. Uh, the white that you're seeing there is antelope um, belly hair. Uh, it really looks kind of like uh, rootlets or something like that, but we've got a definite identification on it. This is a close-up of it. You can see uh, the pronghorn um, toe bone there, uh, part of the skull, um, which is showing through. So we were coming down with very little cultural material, and all of a sudden we hit this lens, a nice mud lens, removed it, and suddenly we were into this mass of uh, hair that um, suggests that people were actually processing hides um, there. Lots of, um, there's the antelope. That one's on Silver Lake, just north of this location. <clears throat> I asked the question, okay, so how do I know that this was brought in uh, by human beings and processed? How do I know that this is not a cougar or a wolf or you know some other carnivore that has brought in the hide and parts of the animals consumed them and left this debris here? So I was looking for direct evidence um, for the processing, and uh, you can see the butcher marks there where they have cut the joint uh, on the uh, legs and then um, probably snapped it off. As a hunter, I recognize that pattern. It's exactly what I do with deer and elk. Um, and so in this case, uh, somebody got into the joint, right into the bone uh, with their cuts. You can see the blood um, and flesh that has mummified there. So that preservation is absolutely incredible. Um, on the uh, hair, uh, we have these large clumps of hair, and this one, I, I indicate, has just been absolutely sheared off, so um, that would take an incredibly sharp um, implement, probably obsidian, uh, to do that. So we've got definite evidence that people were processing um, pronghorns. Uh, in the caves, and this is one way this uh, that uh, the Paiutes um, would run uh, pronghorns uh, and then run them into a corral, and they will not jump over those little low um, uh, walls that you see there. You can actually hold a rope between people and corral them and then have the hunters kill them all uh, and process. So we've got intense activities um, between uh, of uh, pronghorns and um, another uh, black-tailed jackrabbits, white-tailed jackrabbits are showing up at this time period, right around 12,000 years ago. Um, again, these are um, activities that involve a lot of people. So people would come from uh, 100 miles around. They would send the word out to their families, their friends. We're going to have this um, antelope hunt or we're going to have a rabbit hunt so and so's in charge and people would just start showing up and then they would run the rabbits into nets and um, dispatch them uh, and make rabbit skin blankets uh, was one of the things that would be done usually in the fall and so we're seeing quite a bit of evidence that these are late summer um, early fall um, uh, activities that are occurring uh, at the Paisley Caves 12,000 years ago. Here we have a very unique braid, um, braided rope that uh, came up out of the floor uh, of the cave. And so I looked at this um, under the uh, microscope, and it was just an ugly mass of like, you know, it looked like poop. It looked like yeah, all kinds of sticky things <laughs> just massed in there. 
And then there would be these lenses of sagebrush laid down uh, on top and uh, covering this up. And I think what we're seeing is that floor becomes kind of gooey and yucky. And there are lots of insects in it that are attracted by blood, by fat, um, by the, you know, the meat that they're processing. Um, and then they would cover it over and it would start over again. This has been duplicated uh, in uh, Gate Cliff uh, Rock Shelter in Nevada, where they have uh, mountain sheep hunting going on. And so uh, we have uh, a good model for, for that reconstruction. Um, the uh, cordage here is made out of sagebrush bark. Uh, it's, you know, three different cords that are um, braided together. I don't know if you ever did this in kindergarten or whatever for your mom. Uh, at, you know, um, Mother's Day, they would give us, you know, three of these cords and, and then show us how to braid them together. And that's exactly what you're seeing here. It's a unique um, technology. It shows up in the um, Fort Rock Basin to the north of here and in Cougar Mountain Cave. Um, there are a few other instances, um, and it suggests possibly that we have the same people in both Fort Rock and down uh, at Paisley Caves as well. Well, I uh, was working up in cave number five with one crew and had the other one in cave number two. I came back. Um, down to check on, uh, the, make sure that the students were getting good instructions and stuff. And one of them said, let me show you this hair that we found. And so they pulled out this package and I'm looking at it. It's a light colored, very fine hair. And I said, who is salting my sight? <laughs> you become real defensive when, you know, when you're responsible for um, you know, the excavation, and I'm going, who salted my site? This is not a joke. This is not funny. And they're going, no, this has got a clump of, of the floor stuck right to it. Well, eventually, we took um, four of these hairs and uh, cleaned them and ran a radiocarbon date, 10,585 or 12,570 years. So you're looking at human hair that uh, is, you know, pushing 13,000 years. Um, one of the things that convinced me that indeed I was looking at um, an archaeological specimen was the fact that uh, I got it under the microscope and you could just see the masses of nits attached to the hairs, um, just literally clumps of eggs that, uh, <laughs> that were attached. And I became convinced then that this person had shaved their head. Um, they, the infestation was so bad, it was making them crazy. And um, the hairs had just been shaved off. They were all even um, indicating that somebody had probably shaved their head to get rid of the problem. Um, we sent that to Australia. And a woman that specializes in it said, yes, indeed it is human hair, it's looking pretty rough. It's been decomposed to some degree, um, probably due to exposure to the urine uh, you know, that permeates everything. So another problem that uh, Native Americans at this time and this site had uh, were parasites. We found these when we were doing pollen analysis and uh, macrobotanical analysis of the coprolites. Um, and I had uh, a researcher uh, at the University of Nebraska, Carl Reinhard, um, identified these, uh, you know, as a potentially hookworm. Um, so we're actually seeing here, you know, the exposure to, um, you know, to conditions that are not um, sterile, that's for sure. And you think about it, you're living on the floor of the cave, there's dust in the air, the, uh, there's wind blowing, all this hair, um, children running around doing their business because they don't have diapers on. Um, and so, you know, I've been asked before, you know, well, why would you poop in your house? Well, <laughs> you've got kids that, that don't know and they're, you know, gonna relieve themselves wherever they want to. Um, it was consoling to some degree 
to see that we're, uh, right around the fireplace, we did not recover uh, a lot of coprolite. So, you know, but um, basically people would, you know, try to keep, you know, this debris out of their food, but under the microscope, it is absolutely fascinating what you can find. There, are, There's rocks in there, there's dirt in there, there's hair in there, feathers, um, you know, they're not eating this stuff on purpose. It's just impossible to keep it out of their food. I used to think I wanted to run away and live in a cave when I was a kid. I actually took off one day and um, stopped. And a lady said, can I give you a glass of water? And I said, sure. And, and uh, then she said, well, why are you running away? I'm going to go live in a cave. You know, well, are your folks mean to you? No. And I turned around and went home. So. I am convinced now I do not want to live in a cave. Um, the problem is that, you know, you're, you're, that's your kitchen. Uh, they were processing these pronghorns, for instance, mountain sheep, deer, and, and rabbits. There are ticks that get into the ears of these animals, and they live there until they're ready to recreate. And then they fall out and they're on the floor. Well, you're sleeping on the floor. So we find these ear ticks, you know, showing up and all over the world, they are a problem. Um, another problem, you've got the bats in the caves, right? Bats have bed bugs. Yes. So we have found the bed bugs. Then we recover all the bed. We have found the lice that people were putting up with. So um, it was probably at times, you know, when people were really active in there, the floor must have appeared to move with flies, you know, and all kinds of um, beetles of different kinds, scorpions and things that are all attracted by the fact that you're making this mess on the floor of the cave. So no, I don't wanna live uh, in a cave like that. Um, we, um, this is the assemblage, uh, a good representation of the assemblage that we found in the botanical lens. So we've got this lens. The number of artifacts are just incredible compared to the rest of the site. Um, but it's very, um, you know, it's just always the same kinds of tools. You got lots of scrapers. You got these retouched flakes that have been heavily used. And then we've got this um, really nice, uh, if you like oval flake knives, that one is really well done. Projectile points, not, we don't find them. Uh, we have this one um, that is not a completed um, projectile. It's probably a projectile point preform that uh, broke when they were making it. It's got a lot of inclusions, as you can see in it. So what are they doing? Um, this is another large portion of the assemblage. What we have here is cordage. We've got um, sagebrush bark that is in a big wad, and then it comes down, it's been processed into cordage, and, um, and that was stuck in a hole in the floor of the cave. We have these um, knots. There were eight of them uh, that we recovered um, that are just fibers that have been tied together uh, and then trimmed off. And then more of the, um, uh, the braiding uh, and then ropes and such. This is what I think is going on 12,000 years ago. I mean, this evidence really looks like people are making rabbit skin blankets. Um, we have actually found because of the preservation in the Paisley Caves, uh, the strips that are defined or described um, in the 1950s um, to Margaret uh, Wheat um, down in Nevada. Uh, she was talking with Paiutes there and they talked about and showed her how to make rabbit skin blankets. And they just, you know, take a rabbit and then cut the hide into a continuous strip about uh, an inch wide. We've actually found pieces that have, you know, been cut on two sides 
Um, and it's just almost identical uh, to the description she makes. So it appears that people were making um, rabbit skin blankets, something once again that they did uh, late summer and into uh, the fall. The um, wood, here's a wooden point. I mean, this was absolutely beautiful. These are things you will not find on the desert because they get wet, they get dry, they get wet, they get dry, and they break down. Um, uh, we've got sinew uh, on this branch. It's a really rough branch. It looks to me to be possibly a snare. Um, we have uh, a, a feather that has cordage uh, tied around around it um, and was probably um, somebody's decoration, um, perhaps as you know part of a headdress or something like that. Um, the uh, composite fish hook that uh, we found this wooden peg, no doubts about it. These um, 12,000 years ago, people are living, leaving the evidence behind of the activities uh, that they were intensely pursuing. Um, we recovered 13 pieces of obsidian near a hearth uh, that was uh, dated right at uh, about 12,000 um, years ago. <clears throat> obsidian absorbs uh, uh, the uh, water right out of the atmosphere. So it doesn't have to be submerged in water to absolutely, uh, or to begin to absorb it. Here's what the hydration uh, band looks like. If you can figure out the rate that it absorbs the water, then you can actually date the artifact. That's the concept. Um, there are some problems. Uh, for one, you know, the chemistry uh, makeup of the obsidian affects how rapidly it absorbs um, the water. And the second thing is the temperature that it's exposed to affects how rapidly it absorbs. So if it's increased temperature, it kind of opens the pores and the water gets in more rapidly. Well, what does that mean? It means that it hydrates more quickly when it's first deposited on the surface. Then as the process of sedimentation occurs, it begins to cool off as it gets buried deeper and deeper. Now you can have some problems. Either erosion couldn't expose that obsidian and then it's a back on the surface again and then it hydrates quickly. Or you could have, um, for instance, a rodent dig it up, you know, and put it on the surface. So these are some problems that you have, but we know that it is definitely telling us about time. What we can't control are those things uh, like, you know, re-exposure and continuous burial. In a cave, like Paisley Caves, Conley Caves, the deeper the, pro the process occurs, the deeper the deposits get, the more stable the, um, the um, exposure to temperature is. And so these are really great places um, to investigate um, you know, the obsidian hydration rate and then be able to compare that with radiocarbon dates from you know, particular strata. What we can do to control the chemical portion of this process is to just take the primary um, deposit. In other words, the, clear, the nearest obsidian source tends to be the one you get the, the majority uh, of obsidian from. So what we have taken are flakes that are less likely to be reused over and over. And consequently, um, we can do a number of them, you know, find those around a hearth, like I mentioned, 13 pieces around one hearth. You've got a radiocarbon date. You calibrate that to the actual calendar years, and then you compare the mean of, say, the 13 pieces of obsidian. And that's what we've done 534 um, times. Uh, we've done that because we had um, three sites, three caves in particular that we were looking at, and we had to do that through the entire pro uh, profile of each um, site. What do we do about temperature? Well, we're going to look at um, uh, different micro environments within a cave. So these all face to the west. Um, and so what um, we wanted to know was, well, how are we going to 
you know, look at, you know, say 15 meters across the front of the cave, do they all, you know, have the same temperatures or not? So what we did was take these poles, one at each corner of a one by one, all the way across the front of the cave. And then inside those red shotgun shells that you see there, uh, we put these temperature recorder buttons and every 70 minutes they would um, record the temperature of the soil. And then these are spaced out from the bottom of the cave all the way up uh, to within 10 centimeters of the surface. This is what it looks like. We did this um, starting out in 2011 and uh, we changed them out every year. We would download all of those millions of, <laughs> of readings across two caves here in cave number five and in cave uh, number two. And then we would compare uh, our calibrated radiocarbon ages um, to the obsidian uh, hydration and um, vary uh, the uh, calibrations of, for the hydrations as well. What you wanna see are peaks where there are radiocarbon aged peaks and, um, and then have your obsidian uh, match up. And so it does that um, fairly well here. Not everything uh, is perfect, but uh, we expect that um, because of the fact that um, once again, those um, artifacts do not necessarily remain in place uh, in any one place um, because they can be moved around by rodents digging, uh, by people digging and throwing stuff out. Um, uh, people have frequently have the concept that a site represents, you know, where um, artifacts have been deposited uh, by Native Americans uh, or in the historic times. But the truth of the matter is there's quite a bit of movement within the soil um, that uh, we need to be able to account for as much as possible and be aware of when we're interpreting things. So um, we already knew that Luther Crestman had found horse uh, and uh, camelid uh, remains at this site. Here I'm uh, excavating and just removed um, some of the teeth uh, of the maxilla, um, the upper uh, jaw uh, portion of the skull of a foal. Um, and that uh, we then ran a radiocarbon date, 13,600 uh, calibrated years in level um, 62. Below that, uh, about four centimeters in the same level, we got a, uh, a artiodactyl, probably pronghorn rib that had been uh, cut um, with a stone tool. Now, how do we know that it was cut with a stone tool? You've got a bone lying on the floor of the cave. People are moving around in there. There's lots of rocks. Um, uh, if you step on a bone and then push back and it scratches across um, the rocks, it's going to get a scratch in it. So what we did was to um, take some uh, fresh bone, we went down to Safeway and got some pork bones, and we made stone tools, and then we took those stone tools and cut the bone. Then we looked at it and um, we uh, identified eight different characteristics of those cuts. Um, one of them, a couple of them here, parallel cuts, where you know you look at a single knife cut and it looks like a scratch, but under the microscope, you can see these parallel scratches that are typical of the stone tool. Um, we also have these feathered ends at the end when uh, you get done with your swipe across the bone, uh, it leaves a nice feathering like a needle uh, point on it that is not duplicated when you get somebody stepping on uh, a bone and then scratching backwards. So what we did was to look at um, I, I forget exactly how many fossils we had from a non-archaeological site, but another cave where we had hundreds of um, fossils, camels, horses, you know, cheetahs, all kinds of Pleistocene animals going back about 40,000 years. We could not duplicate the patterns that we were getting off of the stone cut uh, bone. Uh, and so we identified these and then compared um, this artiodactyl bone to it. And uh, it's 
uh, clearly um, almost 14,000 years old. Well, in that same lens, between those, between that jaw and the uh, artiodactyl rib, we recovered this stone. I was standing there watching um, the woman excavating it, the student, and uh, as soon as she swept this off, I said, keep your eye on that. That is an artifact. It does not belong there. It's in all of this, you know, very fine um, silt and sand and, um, you know, little tiny pellets of the bats um, and as well as the wood rats. And here suddenly we have this hand-sized stone um, on the end of it, you can see where it's broken. There are three scars that have clearly been knocked off of this um, stone. You flip it over, as you can see, it's here very dark, highly polished. Flip it over, the other side is light tan. When we sent it to the lab in Colorado, um, the woman told me it reeked. It smelled like rotten flesh when we processed that with... Uh, um, with the uh, chemicals that we remove. So um, also I can see stria uh, under the microscope on the end of this. And so this is clearly uh, a stone tool. It's been um, battered, and which is very typical of monos and metodes or pestles. Um, they're used frequently as hammers and they, you know, they're often used to break up bone to get the marrow out. So um, this um, particular um, handstone uh, has grass pollens, you know, lomatiums, which are your um, biscuit root, um, possibly, um, you know, uh, some of your other uh, apiaceae uh, type plants. Phytolis uh, and starches all indicate that this particular tool has been used um, to process um, elephant flesh, uh, which we uh, got proteins off of. Uh, as well as um, plants that we think of as hard work, you know, these small seeds that have to be ground up. And uh, to tell you the truth, I imagine fingers hurt a lot when they held a stone like that and, and ground um, those seeds uh, of small plants over and over. So this is a, a very interesting um, stone artifact because it tells us how much uh, and how how much you know work they were putting into their diet, um, but uh, these you know even though they had elephant flesh, um, they're processing it with a handstone. Now, why would you need to do that? You know, you usually you just you know cut up your steak, uh, and if you've got a whole elephant, you can cut up a lot of steaks. The truth is, and people frequently lost teeth early in life. Um, and so you would have people in your family who had very few teeth and eating elephant jerky is going to be a difficult process for them. So you're drying it to preserve it. Uh, and then it's in an inedible fashion for them. You can grind that and hammer it up. Um, and then you make it soft again, and it can go into your soup or whatever your you know stew that you're making, um, and people can uh, consume it. So there's a good reason to use uh, to have, find that protein on this particular artifact. In the same um, Pleistocene deposits, we got an obsidian flake once again, uh, indicating that it had been used to process mammoth. Our final um, cave here is cave number five. Um, you, these are the excavation units, and we spent a lot of time processing um, samples that we were taking meticulously out of the side of our exposure. What we wanted to do was demonstrate the fact that though we had a rat midden, um, and that's what you're looking at here, is this highly organic, lots of rat pellets, uh, lots of different branches and grasses and stuff that the rats have brought in there. Um, the question is, well, aren't they digging through all of that and constantly churning it up? You know, can you get good stratigraphy out of it is the question. And so what Tom Stafford did was to take a sample every four centimeters from the top of the deposit going all the way to the bottom. So what we should see if we're 
if we've got good stratigraphy are the youngest dates at the top um, up there where it says 7,800 years ago, and then the oldest dates at the bottom down there where you've got 12,450 years. So you're looking at good stratification. I've talked about um, the rat urine quite a bit. There is a lot of carbon in rat urine. And so it's getting into the plants that you're gonna radiocarbon date. So what do we do with it? Well, what Tom Stafford did was take um, double um, uh, distilled water, so super sterile, and he put the twigs that he wanted to radiocarbon date in there. That's Those are the ones at the top. Um, and then the water would, um, would uh, you know, dissolve the, the rat urine in the twig, and then it begins to cloud the water. Then he would de decant it after a day or two, and then do that again, and then do it again until you see those absolutely pure twigs. Then we ran the radiocarbon date on the twig. So we know we're getting a date that represents when that, anim when that plant uh, was living. He then, decanted, this is the uh, decanting process, and then he freeze dried what he had gotten out of the water. Then we ran radiocarbon dates on what he had eliminated that was contaminant. And so what we found uh, was that basically those contaminants were a little bit older than the twig. And so why is that? Well, you know, they're urinating on a surface that already exists. And not only that, but there are carbons of all different kinds being contributed by lots of different processes within the cave. So this is just not a simple process. Um, and people, when they're excavating, particularly in caves, need to be highly aware of the fact that you might be dealing with chemistry that's coming from down below you, from up, up above you, you know, from the rats. I mean, we've got to eliminate the contaminants. So sometimes we've run as many as three or four dates. On one coprolite, we ran 12 dates at $800 a date to understand the chemistry in a human coprolite. Now, we were triggered to that because we got from beta analytic, we got a date of 10,050 plus or minus um, 50 years, all right? We sent it to Oxford, we got a date of 10,965. Those are not statistically the same age and it's the same coprolite, it happened in one moment, you know? So there's no doubt about it. This, this is an event that spans maybe 48 hours. So um, we ran these 12 different radiocarbon dates and we found out it is indeed 10,965 years. So basically um, it should, it just raised the hair on the back of my neck and every archeologist should be aware of the fact just because you have the date that you think you want, you better not just accept it right off the bat. You better question where it comes from stratigraphically uh, as well as well, what could be contaminating my radiocarbon date. So we've spent, uh, I now have 323 radiocarbon dates from one site. And uh, this is probably the best dated site in uh, the Americas. Um, anyhow, what we want to see here are the youngest dates at the top and the oldest at the bottom. Indeed, that's what we've got. You'll notice one of them says 14,230 uh, in red there. That's this item. Um, this appears to be a flesher. It is the only bare bone that we have recovered from the site. Um, it has uh, beveled edges rounding uh, there. Um, people have told me, well, you know, you can get that same pattern by taking an old bone lying on a desert surface and stepping on it and it'll snap. And when it does, it'll have a very jagged edge. Well, we've got one um, that's 12,000 years old here uh, in the upper uh, left-hand uh, part of that um, screen. And that, as you can see, has very sharp edges that have been snapped. They're very irregular. 
Um, yes, there is kind of a, a basic pattern, but there's a basic pattern in a donut and a Volkswagen tire, and they are not the same, you know? I mean, yeah, they're both oval, but they are not the same, and they, neither are these two. We've got a tool here that's been dated directly at 14,230 years. Um, here is another hand stone we got horse um, proteins off of, protein residues. It was found within 75 centimeters of a coprolite um, dated at uh, 14,500 um, that has 9,000 uh, apiaceae um, pollens per cc uh, in it. So a very high density uh, indicating someone uh, had consumed probably biscuit root here. Um, that uh, we also came up then with this uh, basket um, element, uh, which has been dated in excess of 14,000 years as well. So some people tell me, oh, there are no artifacts at Paisley Caves, and that's just not true. <clears throat> These were all found um, right near the bone pit, which uh, we interpret as a cultural feature. If you've ever um, worked with slabs, thin slabs, you know that they don't want to stand on edge. This one has been leaned up against another um, uh, boulder there. And then right behind it uh, is a pit that was dug into the floor of the cave uh, and then covered with a slab. Inside that pit, um, we found um, first this vertebra. It's a thoracic vertebra of a camel. Um, uh, that's Cassie. She was uh, excavating. This is 2002. And we had dug down through two meters of deposit all summer long. And she had found maybe one flake and uh, some rabbit bones, that kind of stuff, you know. Uh, we got to the bottom. And, you know, I think the largest rock she had encountered was the size of your fist. She comes down onto this um, flat slab and so she exposed the out uh, the outline of it and said, can I take it out? And I said, well, wait a minute. We haven't seen anything like this before. Let's be careful. So we'll sweep it off. Let me show you how to pedestal it and, um, and then we'll remove it. So we, we make sure we have a concept of what's under it and we're careful. So I spent an hour with her, you know, and we swept it all off and we began to dig down around the outside so we could, you know, get an exposure, see if anything was sticking out from under it. And then she um, said, can I remove it? And I said, sure. So I walked over, got on the ladder because we were two meters down. So I've got a six foot ladder sticking up, got out, walked down. I was headed across Cape five and all of a sudden I hear Dr. Jenkins. <laughs> it was electric. I turned around, you know, and all the other students were jumping up out of their pits to run over there and find out what she had found. Well, she had taken one swiper with her trowel and hooked the edge of this large bone. And it's a thoracic vertebra of the neck. Um, and so I said, wow, well, wait a minute, don't move it. And we'll profile it and we'll get it mapped in and everything photographs, all that stuff. So we spent maybe an hour doing that. And then she goes, can I remove it? And I said, okay. So I go over to the ladder, get up, walk over. Her partner takes over while she's writing up the notes. I hear Dr. Jenkins, <laughs> I come running back. And here's um, her partner there with a, a camel astragalus. And what we found was just a pile of bones. So then we got the mandibles of the camel. Uh, we got um, this mountain sheep mandible. There were horse um, toe bones, hooves of horses. Um, and so we got to the bottom of the pit and we found a coprolite. And in that coprolite, uh, we found or recovered uh, human DNA. The radiocarbon dates all cluster right around um, 14,300 uh, years or so. We have recently uh, been in, uh, or I was contacted by Max Planck uh, in Germany, and they wanted to know if I, who I was having doom uh, protein uh, analysis, zooms is what it's called. 
And I said, well, I haven't had anybody approach me about it. So they, would you send us samples? I sent them 54 samples. Um, and this uh, is the preliminary results. 47% uh, are camelid. Now these are predominantly unidentifiable. What I did was put in some pieces that I had already had a paleontologist identify. So we knew they were camel or we knew they were horse. I had five samples as my control. And then I just sent these and all they are just fragments of long bones predominantly. And so these are the results that we got. 27% um, horse, 12% um, artiodactyl. So those would be your, your mountain sheep, your pronghorn antelope and deer and such. Remarkably, only 2% bison. And then we got one kitty cat that uh, is a Pantera, which is probably American lion. So now we've gotten around to the coprolites, you know, the real key to the whole thing at Paisley Caves that make it so exciting. What do you do about contamination? So we're talking about DNA. With this is the molecular um, uh, part of us, of everything around us that is alive. Um, and we are all, this is Mount St. Helens, by the way, and I understand that when this erupted in every room of your house, regardless if the doors and windows were closed or not, this white dust was everywhere, like drywall dust or something. Um, that's exactly the way we are. So you're breathing, and in uh, your breath is all this moisture that has your DNA in it. So the truth is that if I sampled all of you for your DNA, I could prove that you were in this room um, tonight because I could come by on all these surfaces around you and collect your DNA. That's exactly what's going on here. We were contaminating as we collected our um, coprolites in the, site, in the site. Even from 2002, we were collecting anything that was a centimeter or larger as if it was human. But we weren't being careful about it because, you know, well, you're not touching it with your hands, but you are touching it with your gloves. Your gloves you've been sweating on, and then you pull them off. And so every surface on your clothing is covered with your DNA. It's molecular. It will even go into a coprolite just right out of your breath and right into the interior of uh, the copper lights that we were trying to collect. So we began in 2009 wearing uh, hazmat suits here, um, two pairs of gloves. You'd put on the purple gloves or the blue lab gloves first, and then you would put on surgical gloves that come clear up to your elbows. Um, and then, you know, this whole outfit that I got to admit, the first time that we pulled this off in the field, it was comedy capers. You know, I'm watching the students, they're getting dressed and I'm going, oh, yeah, no, you can't touch that. You can't. No. And then I said, oh, you contaminated. it. No, I didn't. I said, yes, you did. You touched this and then you you touched that. And that's how. And so eventually we worked out the protocol. Um, and we really did. We reduced the amount of contamination tremendously, but we never got rid of it. Um, the human DNA that's modern is lo much larger than the ancient DNA that's 14,000 years old. So they pull it through what was described to me as an electronic um, uh, net or filter, if you will, that filters out those long strands of DNA and just leave the little tiny um, base pairs uh, of the DNA that they're doing the analysis on. Anyhow, what we found are haplogroups um, A2 uh, and B2 that are uh, common in Siberia. So it appears as if we've been telling people correctly um, forever that people you know, you know, came out of uh, out of Asia uh, and into the Americas, um, you know, that way and, and uh, that our Native American populations here uh, are indeed uh, from uh, Siberia, that area. Well, um, part of uh, the question was, can DNA be translocated through the soil if it gets wet? 
And the answer is yes. We know that, that um, DNA, while it does not preserve well in the environment, can be moved by water. And so um, what we did uh, to address that was to take, uh, I reasoned that if water is moving through the deposits down to a non-human coprolite and DNA of human beings is showing up in that coprolite and it's not human, then it's got to be coming out of the soil. And what else is in the soil? Rat urine. Rat urine has rat DNA. So if that is a product of contamination, it's bringing human DNA, it ought to be bringing rat DNA as well. And so you ought to open up your human coprolite and you ought to get rat DNA in it. We did not. We processed process a number of them and never came up with rat DNA. And yet we could extract rat DNA out of uh, rat bones that we were finding in the caves. So there's no doubt that the preservation is there. It's just a matter, it's not being translocated by water. Another thing, the question was, well, is that indeed a human coprolite? Even though it, they acknowledge the fact that it's got uh, human DNA in it, could it be non-human? And they um, did an analysis on one small fragment uh, that I had given them for another purpose and um, came back and said, this is an herbivore, it is not human. And so what we did was to process uh, uh, about, I think we got about 30 different coprolites, not one, but a variety of coprolites. And we did the exact same analysis that they did and to higher precision, what we found were at least three human coprolites that were um, 13,000 uh, to 14,000 years. So once again, one of those coprolites has human um, DNA, human lipids and sterile, uh, sterols uh, like uh, coprostanol and, and um, uh, cholesterol and such. And so, <clears throat> and bile acids. So basically, this one has got human hair, human protein, human DNA, and, and human um, uh, lipids and, and the sterols and such. So I don't know how you could ever deny that we've got people in the caves 14,000 years ago. So here we're looking at um, the stratigraphy uh, of the cave. Um, I had a, a mini conference where I brought people from all over the United States that are well recognized as paleo Indian specialists. They wanted me to dig a trench from uh, one, the Southern part of the cave to the Northern part of the cave. I really wanted to preserve that portion of the deposits, but um, conceded the, the, the uh, point and was very glad I did. Here you can see the nice flat lying stratigraphy above that is disturbed that real jumbled appearance. This is really hard. I mean, this is um, uh, sand and silt that has been bound together with rat urine into a cement-like deposit. And we just hammered our way through this day after day. I felt horrible for the students are going, ching, ching, ching. And you can just see this little bit of dust come up. You got 15 centimeters of that to cut, you know, basically six inches. And everybody's doing the same thing, ching, ching, and nothing's happening, you know, it seems like. Eventually, we got through it and hit a softer deposit. And then we came down on this mud floor, and I thought to myself, I've seen that. I saw that in cave number two. So I told the excavator, sweep it all off. What's really wonderful about this mud lens is that it's sealed off everything, and unless there's a hole in it, Whatever's below it should be older than the mud lens. And we'll find out how old that is. So we took this photograph um, <clears throat> and we had just dropped through uh, a foot into this marmot hole. And I was really depressed. Oh, no. And so <laughs> we um, were looking at that and I'm going, you know, well, clean it out. Clean out the nest and uh, be extremely careful around it. And we took the photograph and stuff. And boy, was I glad we did. We started excavation again and found the only projectile point 
um, that was found in this particular uh, portion of the site. And it's what we peeled back uh, a part of that mud, two centimeters of it, and there was the projectile point sitting in situ. So that point was on the floor of the cave when the mud lens was formed around it. And so, um, you know, once again, ec excellent stratigraphic evidence that, uh, that this um, uh, particular projectile point was in situ and not a part of the rodent hole. So we did obsidian uh, hydration on it, came back uh, indicating that it was more than 13,000 years. We continued to re remove the mud uh, floor and you can see that large um, battered boulder there. No other boulders uh, on the floor of the cave look like that. This one has just been hammered for some reason, probably breaking up bone or something like that. And then one portion of it has been used um, uh, perhaps to process, um, you know, grind uh, uh, food uh, remains is, are the most likely, um, something like seeds or or even uh, dried uh, jerky or something. Um, the uh, radiocarbon date there indicates the, the time just below the bottom of that mud lens. This is our profile. We have uh, twigs taken out uh, of the cave uh, wall here. Um, this is right next to where the projectile point was found. Uh, every four centimeters, we ran a radiocarbon date. And as you can see, they're nicely stratified. Uh, off to the right is some of the best obsidian hydration evidence I've ever seen. Uh, it's not perfect. There are items that are out of place. You can notice way down at the bottom, there's a 4.4 and a 5.8, but there's also a 6.4. And so uh, in green there, I've outlined um, what is uh, the strongest evidence that this is just nicely stratified with artifacts in it. Um, this is the bone uh, uh, pit that I talked about earlier. Uh, the numbers indicate individual items that have been radiocarbon dated, and there's a projectile point uh, that we recovered from it uh, up in the upper left-hand side. Um, and that one uh, has been dated at about 13,500 years. It comes from this profile. We ran a whole series of radiocarbon dates on horse uh, remains. Um, the megafauna vertebra there is horse as well. Uh, we learned that from uh, our protein analysis. And as you can see, um, this projectile point's been removed from 14 to 15,000 year old deposits. There is no evidence whatsoever of Clovis technology at the Paisley Caves. We know that people were in the caves earlier uh, and during the um, Clovis uh, era. Uh, these are the western stemmed projectile points that we have found, um, but there is no evidence of Clovis at all. So what were Americans, uh, Paleo-Americans eating 14,000 years ago? And uh, It's a really great diet. Actually, um, a lot of grains, uh, roots with, that provide your carbohydrates. Uh, we've got evidence for large uh, mammals as well as small mammals, right down to voles that are basically overgrown uh, mice. Um, and then sunflowers, rose, um, you know, which you give you your vitamin C, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Insects that are really high in, in proteins and uh, excellent food as well as fish uh, at times. Um, are they indeed, do, is the evidence uh, strong for the human um, activity in the caves 14,000 years ago? And I would contend it's beyond question in my, in my opinion. The, the more years I've been working now, 20 years on this project, and it gets stronger every time uh, we run some new form of evidence and, and test something new. Um, we have large mammals, like I mentioned, bison, horse, camel, um, uh, mountain sheep, deer, uh, all being processed uh, in the caves, as well as, of course, like I mentioned, the rabbits providing our technology for, uh, for clothing and, uh, and uh, bedding and such. So in conclusion, Paleo Indians were there, um, according to that mountain sheep uh, jaw, radiocarbon dating of it, 14,500 years ago. 
Um, they were indeed uh, Native Americans, you know, from uh, Siberia. Um, they are well adapted to their environment. They are not exclusively large game hunters as, as uh, has been portrayed for the Clovis uh, peoples, um, but they're um, definitely their technology is Western stemmed uh, as opposed to Clovis. And so what that tells me is we're looking at two different technologies in the um, Americas, at least two, two different technologies. Um, and so this is not unilineal evolution of technology, you know, from Clovis down to Western stem, you know, down to Northern side notch, whatever, all the way down. It is, a, you know, a parallel um, technological evolution uh, occurring. There are different peoples on the landscapes as far as I can tell. Thank you very much. And I'll... Can I, can I answer questions? I guess that's a question. Yes, please. We'd <laughs> love to have you answer some questions. We, uh, we've got a... Is this, is this mic on? It is, yeah. Okay, we've got a, it's a great presentation, Dennis. Thank you. That was just wonderful. Uh, we've got a chance for Dennis to answer a few questions. So let's hit it. Yes. Two thousand five hundred year gap in there. Mm -hmm. Was it because of a geological climate or a food supply disappeared, and that's why they left the area, or there was some reason that might be explain that uh, that gap? Okay, um, that's that is a great question. You know, and uh, I guess am I still on or not? Should I use this? Yes. All right. So, you know, the question is, what about that gap? There's actually, there's more than a single gap. Um, people are using caves uh, at different times, um, sometimes intensively and sometimes not. And we don't necessarily know why that is occurring. Bedwell thought that in the Fort Rock Basin, for instance, that um, just after the Western stem tradition had uh, given out, uh, into the cascade phase, the number of people dropped dramatically, and then there was no occupation in the caves. He thought they had abandoned the area, perhaps because of Mount uh, Mazama erupting the way it did. Um, what we found was that people moved into the sand dunes and that there were plenty of people in the basin. They just weren't in the caves. Well, why not? I don't know that answer. I do not know that answer. What I think happened, I mean, this is the hypothesis, if you will, is that what they were doing in those caves at a certain time was no longer feasible. In other words, seasonally, they changed their patterns. And when they did that, they no longer went into the caves. But it's not because people were not in the area. It's just that they began to avoid those locations uh, for some reason, probably because something else was more beneficial. Yes. Uh, he, she asked, um, yes, thank you. Um, is it on? Hmm. Yep. Now? Okay, so she asked, you know, what about human bones? We find human remains, yes. Um, what has happened is that people have been digging in the caves and um, to get artifacts. They were mining artifacts, artifact collectors. Um, they disturbed human remains and so they scattered them out. Um, we, um, as soon as we find a, a human element, a tooth or little fragments or whatever, I stopped the excavation instantly get it everybody out of there um we avoid photographing that area um and then i contact the bureau of land management and i contact um the klamath tribes um and so at that point they usually say well dennis what's going on is this a burial and i'm going no it's not 
we're in disturbed deposits. I've got 22 case shell casings. I've got glass. I've got cigarette butts. And these human remains, they are from somewhere else. Um, and so uh, what we've done then, and we make a decision, they either shut that unit down or um, continue on. Sometimes I've done one, sometimes I've done the other. It's up to them. I mean, if they say shut it down, it's down. That's it. I don't talk about human remains much because they're so sensitive and they are not um, artifacts to me. You know, they are people. They are people who have family and those families are still around. And I don't want to uh, cause them pain. So it's very um, sensitive, and so I don't talk about it a lot. But, um, yeah, I mean, if people are spending time in any one location, they're going to leave remains behind. Good question. Yes. Thank you. With all the rat urine still having a definite odor and stuff, is there any danger of disease being transmitted? Is there any danger of disease being transmitted? And the answer is yes, there is. Um, we were uh, very concerned about hantavirus um, initially. And so we investigated what happens among the rodent populations. And uh, for one thing, um, wood rats are very territorial. And um, there are lots of wood rats in there. So there are you know, mouse remains, and I don't know if any of them are, you know, white-footed deer mouse or whatever it is that transmits that, but um, we were very concerned about it. Um, uh, some people wear, you know, uh, a mask when they're excavating. Uh, I've never been able to handle that, um, but, you know, um, I know that, that Lauren Davis from OSU came out and did work, and he ended up with what his doctor described as a mushroom growing in his lung. And Tom Stafford came from Colorado and he ended up with a lung uh, issue as well. And so um, there are, you know, I think, you know, there's always been some concern about that. Even um, today, I was looking at uh, photographs from 1938 when Cressman was out excavating in um, Catlow Valley and um, they've all got respirators on, you know, and the dust is just, you know, it's <laughs> just incredibly fine. And it, I'm sure my lungs are full of it, to be honest. Yeah, good question. Um, mostly we haven't had that problem. Yes. Here, that DNA you found, you did a DNA analysis, you said it's from Siberia. Uh, have you looked at uh, uh, you looked at compare the DNA at Siberia and the DNA you found in that Paisley cave? Can you determine? A, they, I think there over time there's like tiny mutations. Can you ad establish a date, a migration date based on that the changes in DNA from the original yeah. Siberian population to what you found in Paisley cave? Okay. Um, that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, it was one that I had really hoped that we could address. Unfortunately, we're getting down to 65 base pairs. Um, you know, and that's just out of a billion base pairs, that's tiny. That is, uh, these are little fragments that most you know, DNA labs would not be able to extract. We're dealing with the top um, people in the world. Um, there's Max Planck. And then there's um, Copenhagen. And those two are exceedingly better than anybody else. Um, and so, but they cannot tell us about that kind of a question. You know, who is this really? Can we reconstruct what they look like? Can we develop a biological clock? And so, you know, when I found out we had parasites, I'm going, who? You know, are these parasites from um, Siberia? If that's the case, you know, we can look at that set of parasites all the way across, you know, every thousand years through the whole deposit, and we can develop a biologic clock that would tell us when humans got to America. Because um, 
you know, we know for a fact that hookworm, you know, came from Asia and it got here somehow and it has to have been human. It's adapted very early to humans in Africa. So um, there's, you know, great questions. Unfortunately, we cannot get to that level of analysis. Good question. And exciting we have a, question. We have a question in the chat. Uh, did the analysis by the archaeo entomologist at PSU provide any other interesting insights? Because I think he was involved. Yeah. So we're talking about Martin uh, Adams, and um, he's, you know, has, you know, found he's been doing um, all of these elements of, uh, you know, of the insects that we have collected. So, you know, we've got these kids sitting there hour after hour picking out virtually anything of interest. And so insects were a part of it and they're getting the legs, they're getting, you know, the bodies. And, and uh, like I said, we found bed bugs and lice and, and, uh, and of course all the rest of the beetles of different kind um, in the caves. And so, you know, we've got uh, grasshoppers that people are eating. And so when I looking under the microscope and, and I've got a copper light and there's a face looking at me, I send it to Martin and he can tell me, you know, what they consumed or, or what has burrowed into the copper light afterwards. So um, he's done some great work uh, and given us real insight into the different environments that people were um, visiting before they, uh, they got to the caves. Thanks, Dennis. Well, unfortunately, we're going to have to uh, call it a night because uh, our uh, <laughs> our carriage turns into a pumpkin at nine o'clock. So <laughs> we got to wrap this up. But uh, right. thanks a million, Dennis. This is this has just yeah. been great. Thank you. Okay, folks, you got uh, right. some books to take home if you want. Uh, and uh, we do have to vacate the premises in about uh, 10, 12 minutes. <laughs>